This is SSN. Story Studio Network. Hi, my name is Pamela Fuseli, and I'm the host of Popping the Bubble Wrap. Are you the person in your family who worries about the safety of others, about buying safety products and using them? Are you yelling, yes, that's me? This is the podcast for you. Raising a child or children can be a hair-raising undertaking, and keeping them safe is a priority. Parachute's Popping the Bubble Wrap podcast explores what you really need to think about as a parent or caregiver, and provides easy tips on prevention strategies. No bubble wrap here, though. Admit it, you've watched your child or children stuff something in their mouths and time seems to stand still as you launch yourself across the room yelling no to stop them from swallowing it. It's a natural way that children explore. They do that through taste, smell, touch. Most items won't hurt them, but there are a few that will. So how do you tell the difference? Today, I have Stephanie, Aaron, and Mark joining me for Parachutes Popping the Bubble Wrap podcast. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Hey, hey. I'm excited to talk about this, Pam. I'm excited to talk about this one. (laughs) All right, good. Well, the most common causes, and I'm interested to know whether this is something that's, you know, high on your list, but the most common causes of poisoning to children are over-the-counter medications, cleaning products, beauty products, those types of things. Does that surprise you? Or when you've looked around your home, Are those the products that you would identify as poisonous or something you want to keep away from your kids? So Erin, go ahead. Go first. (laughs) I realized I said excited and then we're talking about like poisoning, which was probably the wrong sentiment. But I mean, like I'm eager to learn about this. But also um, I realized I feel like every time, Pam, you and I talk, I realize how blissfully unaware I am of some of these things. So if I can just, you know, admit that freely and openly here. Um, yes, I'm surprised that those are the most common. Well, maybe not over the counter medications that that mm-hmm. doesn't surprise me because, it, you know, I'm sure you know better than I do that a lot of them look like candy or they look like fun things right. or, um, you know, they make shaking sounds like rattles and 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 so on. But for me, what I realize is that I feel like I know more about what will likely poison my dog then I do my kids. Like I know don't give the dog raisins and don't let him eat chocolate and all of these things. And like, you know, I, I think I told you this story very shortly after my second was sitting up. She was about six months old. She was just starting to pull herself up on the, you know, the coffee table kind of thing. And I was just getting used to having two kids and it was the middle of the pandemic and it was mayhem. And I turned around and the baby was quite literally standing at the coffee table in the middle of the room all by herself. And she had a battery in one hand and a thumbtack in the other. And I was like, what is life? Like, how are they (laughs) getting these dangerous things? So, and I mean, I guess the battery could have poisoned her Mm, and the thumbtack could have injured her. So did I just like, I just admitted how, like I said, uh, unaware and I need you to school me basically. (laughs) No, you know what? Parents around <laughs> across Canada <laughs> and anyone listening to this podcast are going, oh yeah, uh, been there. <laughs> so you're not alone. And and I think everyone would uh, be welcome the chance to admit, you know, some of the things that happen in, in your homes. I mean, it's just, it's just a matter of, you know, day-to-day living. You can't supervise 24-7. There are some tactics you can use to, you know, keep those things out of their, out of their hands and out of their reach. But, you know, they, the kids develop very quickly and one day they're, you know, lying on their backs and the next day they're crawling and getting access to things that you hadn't imagined they were going to that soon. Stephanie, I know you have, you have a young six month old, um, and, and a boy that's three, you know, this is the prime time of of them searching their environment and exploring by putting things in their in their mouths. What's been your experience with things that you didn't want them to get a hold of that might might be a poisoning threat? Yeah, well, I think 
you know, when my six-year-old and my three-year-old were the three and the infant age, it was easier because we had all that stuff put up in a way. But now Mm -hmm. that, you know, we have a six-year-old around, some of those things are left out. She's leaving out, um, you know, I know markers are non-toxic, but let's just say she's leaving markers around. She's leaving Mm -hmm. small Legos. She's leaving things around that are dangerous for sure. And so now I have to keep them out of two mouths because the (laughs) six month old is rolling everywhere and starting to try and launch himself forward. And then I have to teach the three year old, you can't feed the baby that because he wants to feed the baby (laughs) so bad. Right. And and he's got to understand, you know, you can't put anything in the baby's mouth yet. I mean, he's not even eating food yet. So don't put toys (laughs) in his mouth. And He sees us giving him toys, so he wants to help, and I get it, but yeah, it's a whole new lesson for all of us. I feel like we're all learning again. Keep that away from the kids. Oh, make Mm -hmm. sure that those cleaning products are locked away. And our six-year-old, you know, we had no problem with, uh, she didn't try to put anything in her mouth that was a cleaning product or anything like that, but I find the three-year-old, if it looks pretty, he wants to taste it. Can I so, can I tell a quick story that's like I, I feel like I need to share this. Yeah. The one and only time besides when my daughter had the battery in the thumbtack that I I found myself leaping across the room to shove my fingers in her mouth to make sure there wasn't something in her mouth was when I thought she had eaten an earwig <laughs> off the floor. So it was summer. Uh, or early spring and the patio door was open. So the bugs were coming in. She was sitting on the floor and my four-year-old at the time hollered across the the room, the baby's eating a bug. And I just lost it. And of course I, you know, there was remnants of the bug. I I don't know who (laughs) ate the bug. The dog ate the bug. The cat ate the bug. Somebody (laughs) ate the bug. And, you know, whether that poisoned her or not, I, it clearly didn't, but it was pretty Mm -hmm. gross. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bug, bugs aren't aren't usually high on the list of 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 things that are are risk to poisoning. <laughs> but, but I think it it emphasizes the point that kids will just put literally yeah. anything in their mouths. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you I mean you talked about how how they're packaged or how the products look like medications look like candy. You've got you know the the laundry pods that are fun colors that, uh, and with gel, uh, gel and powder and looks like, like something interesting to, to get into. Mark, are you, are you having, I know you have a, you have an older child who's like 15, probably well out of the, uh, poisoning, uh, poisoning risk, but, uh, does this bring back memories? Is this something that, uh, that you remember dealing with? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I was probably lucky here. Uh, you know, my 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 son who's fifteen, the worst he ever took in was a mouthful of dirt because he was curious what it tasted like, and it was more. Uh, that was probably my leap across the garden in this case to try to get out of his mouth and help him <laughs> clear his mouth, but nothing toxic. Um, and I have a six-year-old daughter, where you know I'm now past that stage of the three-year-old mm-hmm. curiosity. Of, uh, but but when she was younger, we would call gum and Tic Tac medicine too, so she would know she couldn't have it. As in anything, so anything that shook, anything that was looked like medicine, even if it wasn't, we just kept away from her so that she had that same kind of comprehension. And now, of course, she wants medicine because it's Tic Tac. Um, so, but at least <laughs> now at this age, we're not worried about the like locking all the cabinets and blocking off the electrical sockets and all that kind of stuff. You know, my my worry probably now is is less about the six year old taking in some household product because she's pretty aware. It's more the risks to the fifteen year old around opioids, around things mm-hmm. laced with fentanyl. Um, and so it's a different kind of worry. Or prescription meds, and I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm not actually worried about my son with this, but um, you know, we know this is a challenge for teenagers when you know parents have prescription pain meds, et cetera, and the risk of that equals. So it's a it's a different kind of worry I have now than the traditional um, you know, ingesting mm-hmm. the toilet bowl cleaner kind of thing. Well, you bring up an interesting point because cannabis itself, you know, even though it's a legal product now, again, edibles um, are coming in packaging that looks very attractive that, you know, a gummy or a cookie or a candy that adults, if they didn't read the packaging, wouldn't realize whether it had cannabis or not in it. Um, And especially the younger 
children, you know, they they want the gummy. I mean, they don't realize that the gummy itself can be, you know, four, six, eight doses, and they take the whole thing. I mean, adults do the same thing for other reasons, but, but you know, the, that has become um, not only for, for young kids, but obviously for older older kids and adults that are taking these products to be aware of the the danger uh, of poisoning from from a cannabis edible is really high on the emerging issues list of poison prevention. Yeah, I think cannabis comes into will probably maybe isn't there yet, but but over time will come into the same domain as alcohol, where families will have to decide whether they they start to introduce to their kids to get them responsible in how they use it or imbibe it um, mm-hmm. so that when they become of age, they are better able to manage it um, or not. And I think we'll see a lot of different perspectives and philosophies around that over time. Yeah. The, the tips are the same as for medications and cleaning products and those types of things is to lock it up high. Uh, I, I know a lot of us are used to storing, especially cleaning products and those types of things under our sink, uh, under our counters. But, you know, it's just a, um, such an easy access point, uh, for kids and even up high. I mean, it, it gives them, gives you a, a, an extra few minutes to kind of realize where are they, what are they doing? <laughs> it's too quiet, <laughs> but, you know, still, I know very adventurous kids who have, you know, climbed onto the onto the chair, onto the counter, because that's where they know those things are, are located. But it just gives you that uh, another layer of protection um, in terms of storing. One of the things that I'm interested to know is, you know, what do you know about poisoning in terms of what to do if you suspect your child has taken something poisonous? Do you know about your local poison centers? Do you know how to call them? What What is it that you want to know from poison experts about poisoning that maybe we could cover um, in this episode. I know nothing, Pam. I'm like at that point of like, what's the number for 911? <laughs> <laughs> so like, I mean, I know poison control exists. And because, you know, from way back when, when I used to babysit when I was 12 years old, most mm-hmm. homes had the magnet on their refrigerator. But now with cell phones and this and that, like, or whatever, do people even call them cell phones anymore? I don't know what I would do if I suspected that one of the kids had ingested something. Like, do you just call 911? Actually, there are poison centers, five regional poison centers that you can uh, that you can contact. Uh, one is in Nova Scotia, actually. <laughs> So I do have personal experience calling poison control. I actually, um, like Aaron mentioned, you used to have the number on your fridge when you'd be babysitting. Um, I do have it on my fridge. I don't have a babysitter, but um, I've had to call them before. My daughter ate something when we were out in the yard. I'm not sure exactly what kind of plant it was or what possessed her to do it. She was in my husband's care at the time. He always taught her what she could eat and what she couldn't eat in the garden, but she was around 18 months old. So it was just one of those things where I guess it looked pretty and she decided I'm going to eat it. Um, So he called poison control and they walked us through the process of watching her and what to look out for. And they looked up what plant they believed it could have been. Um, There were no real remnants in her mouth or anything like that. So we're not sure how much she ingested Um, but it was, it was pretty scary for a few hours until we realized, you know, she's going to be okay. Luckily there was no emergency room visit or anything like that. Um, but the second time I, um, had to use a nasal spray. I had a really bad cold, but I was nursing my son at the time. And because I had a cold, you can't really take anything when you're a nursing mom for congestion except for nose spray. So I was taking a nasal spray and my husband misheard. And he thought that I said that the my daughter could take it too. She was about four. And so he let her take it because we were all extremely congested. And I said, did you just give that to her? Luckily, it was only one brief spray because she did not want to take a nasal spray. And anyway, so that was our second situation calling poison control. And, and that one was a really scary one because we knew what she had taken and Anyway, long story short, everything was fine, but um, I do now have poison control in my phone, on my fridge. We both know the number pretty much off by heart in case we need to call it. 
Um, so yeah, it, it, the resources are out there. Um, you can Google anything, but Googling anything is going to scare you. So definitely as a parent, you should know that poison control number or have quick access to it because I think it's different in different areas. I know my number here on PEI off by heart, but I think it might be different across Canada. So it's something that, yeah, look up and put it in your phone under poison control. Easy peasy. I think that is excellent advice. Uh, know your poison control number, how to get help. And I want to thank all three of you for being so open and sharing your experiences because I know that parents listening, parents all across the country have had very similar experiences and really appreciate knowing that they're they're not alone and sharing some great uh, great information with them around poison prevention. So thank you all for joining me today. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Parachute's information page on preventing poisoning has great resources for parents, including a poison storage checklist for your home. Go to parachute.ca slash poison storage checklist. That's parachute.ca slash poison storage checklist. It's time to open your parachute. Nancy Murphy is the medical director of the Atlantic Canada Poison Center and an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Dalhousie University. Welcome, Nancy, to Popping the Bubble Wrap podcast. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. So we're talking about poison prevention. What have you seen change over the number of years that you've been working in this position? Uh, well, it was a, a, interesting to reflect on this. When I started as medical director, the iPhone hadn't been invented yet. Um, so I've been around for <laughs> quite a while. Uh and speaking of iPhones, I think that is one of the big th things that has changed is this easy access to the internet. So for good or for bad, it has had a significant effect on poison centers and uh, poisonings in general. So uh, the good aspects of having such easy internet access is that it's easier to raise awareness and send appropriate messaging to parents using online platforms. Uh, you can access a much larger portion of the population this way. You can get uh, important public health messages out there. And so that's been a huge boon to uh, poison centers across the board. And certainly it's um, easier to order poison prevention equipment online, such as the important lock boxes that we always talk about. Um, but that's, those are the good aspects. The, the you know the sort of less advantageous aspects of the internet from a poisoning prevention point of view is that you know the amount of information that is out there it's hard to sift through and I think that there is there has to be a lot of attention paid to uh, misinformation and the possibility thereof. So looking for uh, poisoning information online can be a little tricky that way. Uh, so you may misinterpret information or you may obtain actual misinformation. And so uh, being careful about where you look is important. But knowing that even though you have internet access, you can look look up all kinds of information, the best way to get the right information at the right time is to actually call the poison center. And so, so there's that. Um, the other aspect of being able to get things online is that a lot of people now have access to non-regulated products with packaging and contents that really don't go through prop proper channels for quality assurance and safety. And so that I, I would see as a huge disadvantage um, in terms of internet access in the realm of poison prevention. So that, that would be the big thing that I think has changed. When you look at the, the types of poisonings we're seeing, I mean, in general, the calls that have changed over the years in complexity. We're getting much oh, okay. more complex calls than we used to. And this is due to numerous factors, including you know, larger amounts of medications being prescribed, higher numbers of chronic diseases that are being managed by these medications, a vast increase in development of new medications, and an increase in, in overall mental health problems, including substance use and the treatments for substance use. 
And so all of these factors together result in really more medications contained per household, and therefore an increased risk of children being exposed to these medications and other chemicals. And so some of the big in, biggest increases in prescription medications in the last 15 years or so that have been noticeable in poisoning statistics have been antidepressants, uh, antipsychotics, and heart medications, all of which can, that can cause serious effects in children. Now, th that's sort of a, a less uplifting aspect. <laughs> um, <laughs> A positive aspect to uh, change over the last 15 years is that, and this is based on uh, U.S. historical data because we don't yet have historical Canadian data, uh, but the percentage of calls related to children being exposed to a poison has gone down by about 10% over this time period. So that's that's really good. I mean, that shows that the great efforts um, in surveillance uh, by poison centers and targeted interventions by collaborations with public health and other regulatory agencies have really improved poisoning prevention. And right now, of course, we are seeing the impact of collaborations between Canadian poison centers and Health Canada and Parachute already. I mean, in the last two years, we've, as a group, um, sounded the alarm on hand sanitizer packaging during the pandemic, on accidental ingestions of cannabis edibles in children. And even very recently, the shortage of over-the-counter medicines that has resulted in accidental errors in uh, providing children with much-needed medications when they're sick. And so all of these issues have resulted in governmental communications and actions to improve poisoning prevention with the help and expertise of poison centers. And I think that's a big change, is this ability to collaborate and effect change. Uh, and improve things. So I think uh, that's a very positive outcome in the last 15 years. Yeah, that's especially um, encouraging that that the overall rate of of um, poisoning for kids has gone down. If you know the poison center is so important, you know, for parents um, when they either suspect or they know that their child has taken something that you know could have adverse effects. What kind of advice would you give parents um, to prevent poisoning? You mentioned the lock bag or the lock box. Um, but, you know, when you think about the types of, of substances, like you were talking about pain medication, um, heart medication, cannabis products, what is the advice you would give to parents so that they don't have to call the poison center? Right. I mean, the prevailing message throughout the years in, in terms of poisoning prevention has always been to keep all medications, including over-the-counter things, chemicals, household cleaning products, locked up and out of reach of young children. If they can't get to it, that's the ultimate preventive measure. And no calls need to be made to anybody. But um, we know that's, you know, a, a, a very lofty goal. Uh, there, But there are lock bags, lock boxes, and devices that are made to lock cupboards and so forth. And so you can anticipate every scenario, though. Accidents happen. So you can do everything you can at home, uh, but exposures still may happen. But I think that's the biggest message is lock it up and keep it out of reach. But the thing that people don't think about necessarily, you could do all of that. <laughs> and then um, anytime anyone is visiting your home, whether it's a dinner party or a holiday visit, keep in mind that your visitors are also bringing pills and possibly other harmful substances into your home. And so even if you've done all the preventive things in your home, that goes out the window. If your guests keep their pill bottles on their nightstand in the guest room or in their purse that's sitting on the living room table. So that's a huge issue. And it's something you don't necessarily think. You think, I've done everything I can. I'm perfect. And then this happens. So um, that is certainly one aspect. The other aspect that keeps coming up is uh, keep products in the original packaging. Um, a classic example that we always bring up is putting windshield wiper fluid in a pop bottle. And then somebody drinks it thinking it's a sports drink or something like that. And, and accidentally drinking that could cause severe illness. 
The other thing is people bring, you know, let's say uh, I have to take my daily pills today, so I'm going to just throw it in a Ziploc bag and put it in my purse. Well, okay, we won't know what you the, the child may have had access to then. And so we can't assess what the substance is or what the concentration of the substance or dose of the substance is. It makes it really, really tricky. And so we have to err on the side of caution and then send everybody in to get assessed when really, if you had the original packaging, it would probably be no big deal. That, that's really important. And and I think, you know, locking medications and, and over-the-counter even, as well as prescription up high, you know, the, the one of the probably contributing factors to the reduce reduction in, in poisoning for kids is those child resistant caps. And some parents may think that they're child proof and they can't get into them, uh, but they're ch- called child resistant for a reason. They're sort of adding that layer of protection of time so that parents can sort of catch a, ca- catch a kid if they've, they've gotten a hold of the bottle or, or that kind of thing as well. So it's, it's really important to know that that's not just because they have those caps on it and you can't get them open, exactly. <laughs> their kids can probably figure out how. Exactly. And and one last thing, because we're talking about pills and chemicals and tangible things. The other important aspect to uh, poisoning prevention is make sure your smoke and carbon monoxide alarms are in good working order, especially during the winter months when power outages may result in use of generators or propane-fueled heating devices. And, you know, these gases can accumulate in your home and can cause very serious health effects. And you might even be asleep while it's happening. So alarms alerting you to poisonous gases are crucial in preventing tragedies. So that's a really important and easy one to to deal with. That is really important and probably not something that parents might think about top of mind from as a poisoning. If you could make one change that would make a significant difference to reducing poisoning in Canada right now, what would that be? I mean, there are obviously uh, a lot of things that could be changed in a perfect world. Uh, A realistic goal for poisoning prevention, I think, would be packaging. So um, improvements in packaging regulations for products that can be dangerous for children. I would say anyone who works at a poison center would wish for a boring, brown, childproof package containing only small amounts of product with a bunch of warning labels on it. But this is probably (laughs) not feasible. (laughs) Um, First of all, packaging for potentially toxic substances that um, is attractive to children is very problematic. And we've seen that over and over again. So as an example, I mean, even laundry pods, they're brightly colored, they're fun and squishy. I want to play with them. So children will definitely want to play with them and and eat them because they're exploring. And cannabis edibles, they're made to look like candies, cereals. They are candies and they, they can be in brownie form, cookie form, whatever. Obviously, children are going to want that. Um, And yet they contain large amounts of drug for a small child. Uh, Even for grownups, we, I mean, I I can say that I, at the beginning of my career in emergency medicine, never saw anyone come in with cannabis-related illness. And now it's not uncommon. So even in elderly people. Um, The other thing that for packaging that people may not think about is uh, vaping cartridges. Uh, they are not child resistant or child proof and they can smell like fruit or bubble gum. Um, and they're particularly dangerous for children since nicotine liquid can be easily absorbed through skin and and obviously through swallowing, but even very small amounts can cause serious toxicity. So as you pointed out, child resistant packaging does create this physical barrier to a little one gaining access to a poison. But it isn't child proof, and ultimately that's not what's going to save you. It's going to be don't give them access in the first place. But I can say that um, poison centers are often the first to realize that products with kind of these problematic packaging, uh, they they pose risks to children, and important interventions have been undertaken recently through collaboration with Health Canada. Uh, For instance, the hand sanitizers during the pandemic, which were much needed and companies were out of the goodness of their hearts trying to help uh, 
give people access to hand sanitizers, but the packaging uh, turned out to look like a juice pouch or an applesauce pouch that could be ingested by a small child and were very attractive to children, as an example. So, um, you know, it is it is important to consider packaging and marketing and, and all that kind of stuff in, in what products you bring into your home. Yeah, I think, you know, all of that is such great information and and for parents to really think about that up high and locked is really the the key if you have those types of products in your house um, and to be aware when people are coming to visit or when they go to other people's houses that they may not have the same approach. They may not have kids, so they don't even even think about it this way. But I think the information that you've shared is, is going to be of real interest to, to a lot of parents and, and a lot of new information. So thanks so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be part of this. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. Popping the Bubble Wrap is a podcast of Parachute, Canada's national injury prevention charity, whose mission is for Canadians to live long lives to the fullest by preventing serious and fatal injuries. We release episodes every two weeks. Next episode, we'll be talking about what we call threats to breathing, choking, strangulation, and suffocation hazards. Help us reach parents and caregivers by sharing this link with your friends and family and giving us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Popping the Bubble Wrap is produced for Parachute by Story Studio Network and Eye Contact Productions. This is Story Studio Network.